but anyway um really appreciate the uh, b-sides knoxville team for um, reviewing and accepting my presentation um i've really wanted to give this talk um for a little while um it is uh, going to cover um, how to take your company um, cybersecurity, physical security, operational exercises, um, and make them more fun. Um, so I'm trying to work on adapting tabletop gaming logic and gamification uh, techniques um, to your would-be normal, boring tabletop exercise where everybody gets around the conference room and just always goes down a magical happy path and everything works out and everybody always wins which we know is not always the case but let me get it right into this so uh there you go so i work for a federal power company um i am on the twitters you can find me at tn balls fan 29 um, i am currently working on a book covering these concepts that i hope to publish around um end of october um on amazon um, I have a lot of experience um, with exercise planning uh, development um, and conducting them. I've been our agency lead planner for at least six different um, agency level exercises, um, participating in uh, the EISAC GridX exercise, participated in CyberStorm, um, which is a DHS exercise, uh, participated in some agency level ones. Um, covering both the cyber components as well as your natural disaster and physical security types of attacks. Um, so I've also been a member on the GridX working group. Um, I've been the co-cyber team lead, um, helping create the national level cyber injects for all of the electric sector. Um, so needless to say, I've been doing this for about 10 years um, in various capacities. And then prior to that served in the US Army for five years um while they're uh, conducted the field exercises where i learned a lot from uh, members down in fort polk louisiana and out there at ntc um, on how to be the opposition force and how to conduct uh, those types of exercises so i have that background as well uh, but what we're going to look at um, is kind of the core elements of a game um, so we've all played games since we were kids whether it was board games card games video games now games on your phone or tablet or computer, or whatever. Um, we all have a lot of experience playing games, but if you haven't really ever looked at kind of what makes a game fun or what does a game really need, uh, Mark Rosewater, um, who was a member of uh, Wizards of the Coast, wrote an article um, uh, covering the, the 10 things that I thought was a very good article. I'm a big Magic the Gathering player, so uh, in a Dungeons and Dragons player, so it was right up my alley. Um, but the 10 things that he pulled out um, was number one, you have to have a goal or goals. There has to be a reason that you want to play the game. Um, there has to be a way to win. Um, you have to understand what that is up front. Otherwise, you're just going through an endless world, doing quests or doing missions or doing an endless battle that doesn't really get you to anything. So if you're not driving to a purpose, then nobody really wants to play for it, play that game, and they're not going to be excited about it. Uh, the other core element that all games have are rules. Um, without rules, the game isn't fun. Um, there has to be a way uh, to keep the players within the limits and the bounds of what's capable in that game. And the same applies to exercises, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. But um, even when you get into you know, things like combat, there's rules of engagement. It's not really to make it fun, but it's to make it um, keep everybody within the limits and bounds of what's allowable by the law or what's allowable by your regulation. So we're always working in these environments now today. We have to do our business following a certain set of rules, whether that's compliance-based, policy-based, government uh, regulation or law. Um, so the way that we run in the uh, games is the same way. Your players have to have a way to interact. Um, there has to be some sort of either dice or cards or characters or uh, some component that drives your players um, to be immersed into that game, to get some sort of build up to that story. Um, it's not just all revealed to them. Um, otherwise, you're kind of missing some of the fun of exploring and learning and 
diving into the different areas. Um, the other most uh, popular thing that you run into a lot um, is a catch-up feature. So a lot of games, you know, if you have that player that just gets way ahead, then, you know, it's not much fun. Oh, they're automatically going to win. But if you've ever played the game Shoots and Ladders, it just takes one faulty dice roll and they come crashing back and then everybody else is back in the game. This is something that's often missed with exercises. So uh, in exercises, you'll constantly just hit the players over and over and over again with uh, injects and they just get beat down. And there's no way for them to catch up because the uh, designers and developers of the, the exercise really didn't build that in. We'll talk about ways to do that here in a second. Inertia um, is really just kind of keeping the game pace um, going. Um, a lot of your video games are set, um, we'll put like distance between where you have to go on the quest um, to get to the reward or to complete the mission. It's something that has to push you, but it's not just automatically giving everything away. Um, uh, games also include a lot of surprises. They cover a lot of strategy options. Um, so it's ways for your players to think about how to beat it. Um, also fun. If you go through the or go through the game and it's no fun, especially even starting out of the gate, then nobody's going to want to play. Um, it's something that has to be focused on and incorporated throughout the whole life cycle of the game. Um, flavor. Flavor is making your game and your exercise something different. It's something that attracts um, players to want to come and do it. Um, and it has to be something that's exciting and gets their attention, which also feeds right into your hook. The hook is the marketing of the game. Why do we want to play Super Mario Brothers? Because we went over to Johnny or Janie's house who had Super Mario Brothers and they were playing it because it came with the system, but it was a really cool game. We sat down, we watched it, and then we fell in love with Super Mario. And then all of the other Super Marios and everything else Mario related, we were automatically kind of had that hook where, hey, Mario 1 was fun, let's try Mario 2. Um, we'll look at the elements of uh, what's required for an exercise, but I'm gonna go ahead and skip into how, com how we combine these. But these are the main core elements that um, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, Homeland Security Exercise and Evaluation Program, HSEEP, um, is going to point out um, as the key elements that are required for all exercises. Uh, you have to have a goal, so same as a game. You have to have objectives. You have to have a scenario. You have to have the master scenario events list, the exercise evaluation criteria, and a remediation plan of action and milestones. So when we combine all of the things from a game and an exercise development, we end up with these 15 areas that once they're put together, you should be able to structure your exercise in a way that's not only a learning opportunity for all your players, and a way to identify gaps in your policy, practices, and procedures. That's what exercises are testing. They are not testing your player's knowledge. They are testing your documentation, your tools, your training, and um, the policies um, and work instructions and things that are available to all of your members of your company to go and actually conduct the business should any of these events actually happen. So if you're running an exercise and your players don't know something that either wasn't written down, they weren't taught it, or there's not some sort of practice of using that process on a frequent basis that they were familiar enough to go back and redo or carry out that incident response program or carry out that incident action plan or communicate information wherever it needs to be. So when we set our goals <clears throat> for exercises, what we're really looking at is what do we want the players to learn? Um, at the end of the day, what are my learning objectives for each group? Generally, it's going to be um, activating and uh, initiating all of your incident response, action plans, uh, process and procedures, communication, interaction with other uh, organizations within your business, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, your objectives, I'm going to talk a little bit more about them here in a minute um, on how to create smart ones. I'll talk more about the scenario. 
the master scenario events list. Um, then I'm going to talk about how to create um, kind of the key elements of it. That's your list of badness. Um, so that is everything that has been planned um, as far as your injects to test your players. Um, it's what your players are going to see um, in your time-based order um, for whatever time frame of an exercise that you're running, whether that's a couple hours, day, multi-day, et cetera. Good thing I don't have my video on. My cats are wanting to visit. Um, anyway, uh, again, rules. Exercises have rules, just like games, just like our day-to-day -day lives um, that must be followed. They must be communicated to your players. If the player playing in an exercise isn't like normal business, it's you have to go into the fantasy world um, that you've created based on all of your given elements. And then you have to bring your players in and let them know how to work within that world. Um, they're not actually performing a lot of the functions unless you're doing a functional exercise. And even then, those functions are performed in a very controlled manner, not the high stress, high risk um, environment they might be done in a real world. Uh, so it's just something that you need to work ahead of time in the game, planning um, of your schedule to set um, your training time for your players, let them understand how the game is going to work, what they're going to see, how they play the game, and we'll talk about the golden rule here in a second. Um, your interaction. This is something that you really want to drive your game. So if you have multiple business units and multiple different players, you really want to push them to communicate amongst each other like they would do in a normal course of operation. This is generally the number one lesson learned that you're always going to run into with any exercise you ever conduct. They don't talk. For some reason, your players will hesitate from communicating between business units. They'll hesitate from communicating within groups. It's something that has to be encouraged, it has to be forced almost based on the events that they're given. The only way they're going to solve that problem, like in a game, you would have to go find that one NPC that had the answer. In the exercise, you have to go find that one business unit or member that might have that piece of information, and it might require them calling multiple people. Uh, but it drives that um, improvement opportunity that later they're able to understand better what each other group does, what they bring to the table, what you know um, area of fire that they're going to cover whenever the, the battle is being waged. You get a better understanding of who does what and who to talk to, so that if an event really does happen, I know I need to call this person to do this action, or they need to know about this because they have all of these other downstream things that are going to happen if something really does go bad. So the other thing that I, I learned um, recently is how to build in the catch-up feature into an exercise. Not something that I had ever really considered, um, but it's a very valuable part. So generally in an exercise, uh, when you kick it off, you're going to have all of your players sitting around a conference room going, okay, well, we're just waiting for all the bad things to happen because we're knowing our exercise and bad things are going to happen. And then bad things start happening and they get beat down and get behind because they'll, you know, get wrapped around the axle on varying level of nitpicky details or um, other things that you will experience, which is always a lot of fun to try and work through. But it's a way uh, you have to build in something that can push them on uh, past that. So uh, catch up features that I've figured out for our exercises is giving them additional resources. So in an exercise, you only have the players that are at the table generally playing the game. But everybody in your company who would be part of that response is available or could be available given a real life event. So that's something where you keep in mind that you have all of these resources that are available that aren't in the game. You can simulate, you know, if they get stuck on, well, we need to go do forensics on this box, or we need to send people to this site, and, you know, we need to do this or that, or whatever that's going to take up their time and change their focus off of that learning objective. It's, well, we'll send Team X ray or whatever that we have over here on the side. We'll send them to go do those functions, and you guys get focused back on this other event uh, that's happened. 
Um, and that will generally kick them into gear on focusing on what you're trying to get them to learn and not get wrapped around the axle on the little nitpicky stuff. Uh, the inertia, um, generally in an exercise, what I've found is that you'll have lots of players who are sitting around the table um, waiting to play. Um, they didn't get the inject or they're not involved in the inject. Um, that stuff where you don't really have to throw them like new injects, but it's something where the pace of play needs to keep everybody going at the same kind of rate. Uh, so a lot of times what I'll do with exercise planning is I'll list out all of the injects that I have across the time spectrum that I'm using. And then I'll time box all of them and then also figure out which groups will be affected. And almost if I have to, which players will be affected. So I know that if I'm only affecting a group um, with a 10 minute inject and it's gonna be another two hours for them, or maybe that's the only inject that they're gonna be uh, involved with, maybe I bring them in for just that one to two hour time frame. Let them play, let them see everything and then say, okay, well, you can be released and you know we'll bring you back for the after actions, but we think we got it from here. Um, go back to your normal day-to-day -day world. Uh, surprise, um, you know, it's easy to kind of, you know, build all of your injects around, well, we got this phishing email and it got clicked and the user got hacked and they were able to get admin and then they bounced here and, you know, you go through the same kind of yada, yada, yada. Um, it's easy to build. It doesn't require a lot of thought. You don't have to go analyze your policy and procedures and your working environment to figure out what the gaps are, but it's not a lot of fun and it's not exciting for your players. Um, if it's the same types of injects year after year after year, exercise after exercise, they're gonna lose interest and they're gonna stop playing. So really looking for those areas of opportunity where maybe instead of vish or fishing, you go to vishing or you go to an insider threat or you go to um, a supply chain based compromise, or you go to another avenue that hasn't been explored. You vary it up um, and you give them, you know, a different way of looking at it. Maybe that's an entirely different response. I know for some, uh, phishing is always handled by the IT group or the cybersecurity group. Vishing may or may not be handled by them, might be handled by your physical security group. Has your physical security group even had a discussion about what vishing is and how that works? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, the strategy, um, so you can have your players, they'll often get in either the, the top level, we wanna talk about all of the high level response or they'll get into the detail weeds, ones and zeros level um, as far as the response. You really have to try and push them to have both. Um, so designing your players around those emergency operation control centers, as well as having the technical, uh, physical responding incident response teams at that lower level, you get both out of that. And they're able to figure out and build a strategy on how they're going to manage not only the incidents that they're having, but also the incidents that might be coming later on in the exercise. It gives them an opportunity to get a plan together, this is a great opportunity to really test all of your emergency operation procedures and your incident response team procedures. See what type of plan and strategy they can come up with. And then after the exercise is over, really sit down and talk about that. I've talked about fun, flavor, and hook. Um, the exercise evaluation criteria, the main difference between an exercise and a game is that you're wanting to make things better from an exercise. A game, you always want to play it better, but I always want to try and be that, that top high score, but you're really not critiquing yourself on a lot of games to be a better player or to learn more on how to play. In exercises, that's exactly what you're trying to do. You're trying to find the improvement opportunities and your tools, training, techniques, practices, policies, and procedures that will make you ready for when those uh, actual events and bad days happen so that it's either not as impactful or hopefully you'll be able to prevent it. And the ultimate goal out of your exercise is to come up with a comprehensive, effective, and implementable remediation plan of action and milestones. This is the list that you send to your leadership and management and say, hey, if this event happened today, this is what would hurt. This is where we need to invest money, 
to make it not hurt as much or to hopefully prevent it. And that's where you take that remediation plan of action and milestones and you fit that in um, to your project life cycle. You go get the money and the support and the time to go make those corrections. And then you tie it back when, it, when those are closed out, hopefully, and you say, hey, we were able to implement this. Let's go exercise it again and see and show that how much better we are. Or we fixed this gap that could have hurt us. That was a re direct result of us conducting this exercise. So the next time you're trying to go out there and sell the next exercise, you have that hook of we've made X amount of remediations from the previous exercises. It's an easier way to gain support for your, your training program. Resources. Um, so when I first started uh, designing and developing and supporting exercises, there weren't a lot of great um, resources that I could find until I found HE. So thankfully, FEMA has dealt with pretty much every natural disaster, a lot of physical disasters, um, some cyber disasters, um, and they have a whole exercise training program that can be adapted, picked up, and they have all of the resource toolkits that you could ever possibly want to go and customize or tailor or whatever you want to do to them. Guess what? They're free because your tax dollars paid for them. So congratulations. Um, but there are training courses that will go into a lot of depth on all of the varying levels and ways uh, to develop exercises, to evaluate them, to conduct them, to do that improvement planning. The only thing they don't cover is how to make them fun. And that's where I'm trying to adapt the tabletop gaming logic elements. So we had talked about um, objectives. Um, this is just like your uh, performance objectives. You wanna make them smart. Uh, you wanna make them specific, covering the who's, what's, when, where, and why. Um, you wanna make them measurable. So there needs to be uh, a player did good, category, a player did okay, a player did mediocre, um, a player needs improvement, whatever. Um, you have to have some way um, for each objective that you list, what is that criteria? What is your expected player action based on the policy and procedures and training? Um, they have to be achievable. Um, so if you've made the Kobayashi or Maru uh, scenario and your players are just going to lose, then probably not uh, the best exercise. And you wanna go back and look at that one. Um, or you, you've given them the kitchen sink exercise where there's a hundred objectives and there's no way that they're gonna meet them in a one hour exercise. Really, the, the planners are responsible for making smart objectives um, that will engage the players, will work within the exercise scenario um, and will deliver those uh, learning objectives that you're really after. Um, they have to be relevant um, to the mission um, and organization, and they have to be time bound. So there should be specific uh, criteria and going back to that time box of how long is this event going to last? How long are we going to work on this specific objective? Um, what are we going to do as far as getting this information in front of the players? giving them enough time to process it, giving them enough time to act on it, and then uh, respond and close. Yeah. So your scenario. So this is just like your Dungeons and Dragons campaign book um, that gives you the world. Um, it sets the limits and bounds of the exercise. It sets the ground truth for the exercise environment, giving you all of your conditions of your systems, what your network looks like, what your environment looks like, what resources you have at your uh, that are available to you, who is where, what is the state of the world overall. Um, you know, if you're building the the super black sky end of days exercise that we've had run before, you know, what are the events that led us up to that? What you know is the state of government relations and geopolitical tensions and activity based or on our APTs and adversaries, you have to kind of come up with all of that because your world is what the game is going to play, be played in. Um, it has to be plausible and relevant to the exercise. So if there's an area or an element 
that will totally throw off your exercise. Like um, in a lot of the electric exercises, they will rule out um, any sort of EMP, uh, solar flare, that sort of stuff, because it's just not plausible and it's not generally relevant to the exercise scenario. Um, we'll generally rule out a lot of nuclear um, stuff because it will throw off and totally skew the entire exercise. We have exercises for those, but usually not relevant to the larger, larger overall um, exercise construct. Uh, so really look at those elements in your um, exercise, what is going to matter to your players and what is going to make them kind of just switch gears and go in an entirely different direction than what you intended. I run into that a lot, it's not fun. Um, it's generally hard to bring the players back to the table um, for the next exercise. And it's also hard to fix the exercise that you're running then. Um, you want to go through identifying threats and hazards. Um, we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, but also uh, weather conditions. Um, weather conditions are very important. Um, so if we're running um, an exercise and we're doing it, you know, and we're in the upper Midwest and it's uh, December, then obviously you have to deal with snow, which they're more uh, built to deal with, or the Northeast or et cetera. You get down on the South and we have a foot of snow on the ground. We shut down and every, it's a bread and, milk, bread and egg emergency which I've yet to figure out how that fixes anything, but we go get our bread and eggs and maybe a bottle of wine and a case of beer and we, we go stay in our houses because we don't like snow. But that then changes how your, what resources you would have available to you in that exercise. Who would be able to move? You've now also increased how long it takes to get from point A to point B. Um, Cause we stop driving and we start driving 20 miles an hour that's just how it is. Um, the last element is your model modeling and simulation. So if you're running that uh, cyber range, um, the technical elements um, as part of the game, if you're running uh, the physical elements, like the if you're trying to get a down patient out of a, a restricted environment, or if you're trying to uh, do the physical response to a fire alarm or a fire drill or something like that. Um, or if you're running that mock interview for your leadership um, to go and test them on how they would respond to media-based questions, take some time and really plan those out. Um, they're great to incorporate um, to get you to that functional level of an exercise, which is generally the ultimate goal because then you just have the actual muscle memory of responding to the events. But they shouldn't be the focus. Um, they're nice to haves, um, but what you're really trying to drive after is that communication, interaction, intergroup play, um, group lesson learn development environment. So those when those elements get added, if you're not careful, it can skew the exercise. Um, but just something to consider. So the tabletop exercise 101 golden rule. <clears throat> your observer controller, which is the person that's sitting there with your uh, groups, um, generally you'll want to have more than one, um, but they are essentially your dungeon master from Dungeons and Dragons or uh, the guide um, out of the escape room um, that will set the stage and provides the environment. So they will um, either help deliver or deliver the injects to the players saying, here's the event that's happened. Here's what went boom. Here's the information that you have about it. Go. Um, the players should then talk through and go through the actions that they would perform based on if that event was real. Obviously simulating a lot of events or actions that they would do, um, but then they tell the OC uh, what they're going to want to do. Um, so, hey, uh, we want to get uh, network logs off of this system, or we need to get a network map because we don't even know where that system is, um, or we you know, want to go communicate to um, the physical security team 
get them involved, get them spun up. We need to go spin up our incident response team. And the OC will say, cool, make that call or here's the resolution to the network logs. Okay, you ran, tell me what command you ran. And they'll explain whatever command they ran. They'll be like, okay, here's the information that you found, or here's the packet capture that we've prepared as part of the inject. The players don't answer or provide the resolution to what they're wanting to do. If they try and do that, you then have superhero players who will try and win the game by basically going end around what you've developed. Um, I've run into that a lot. It is not fun. I've tried to explain this to the players. That is not how these games work. And that's really where if you find people that have that tabletop gaming experience, they understand that. You basically tell them, hey, we're going to run a company exercise. It's Dungeons and Dragons for the corporate world. And they're going to be, cool, I'm ready to play. Uh, but anyway, so golden rule, always remember. When we talked about um, identifying threats and hazards, um, this is kind of my methodology for how I go about it. I try and figure out what the learning objective is that I'm after. Um, so these are a couple that I'm working on uh, for grid X6. Um, so coordinated response to a substation physical attack. There are lots of ways that that can happen. Um, but what I'm after is if area X was attacked by some physical means, what does that mean for us? How do we coordinate between our business units on responding, remediating that event? How do we work with local law enforcement? How do we work with local EMS, fire department, et cetera? How do we work with our local power companies who might've shared that site? That's the learning objective. That will relay up to one of our overall exercise objectives. But then I can go through the other means of, well, how do I wanna blow it up? What physical attack do I want to do? Um, what is the difference between those? What is the difference in our response? And I can communicate with all of our other groups that I've incorporated into a planning team to have those levels of discussion talking through these scenarios. Um, so ways to cause the impact. Uh, you're looking at all of the means and methods, either on a physical side, an operational side, natural disaster, um, so if God wants to get in the exercise and start, you know, throwing tomatoes down, how does that change things? Um, you're looking for all the ways that that impact can happen. You then have to go and do your gap assessment. So what is the existing policies, procedures, practices, tools, technology, et cetera, that applies to that event? What are we going to do with it? How is it going to be communicated? How is it going to be detected? Um, how is it going to be responded to? Do we have a policy for this? Do we have a practice for this? Some cases you don't. I've found lots of them where we just didn't have anything written down. There's a lot of tribal knowledge that the players had just built up over time. A lot of chair side training that happens all the time, but we never actually sit down and write, this is how you do these functions. Um, so that's where um, you get into, um, you know, identifying your lessons learned even before the exercise starts. And just because you don't have a policy or practice or procedure about something isn't always a bad thing. That can be an opportunity when you go into the exercise and say, all right, we already know that there's nothing that's gonna tell them how to do this. Let's see what they do and how they respond to it. And maybe we make that the starting grounds for how we write the policy after this. Um, but this is what I would go through um, as far as attack mapping. I would lay out all of the learning objectives. I would come up with all the impacts. And this is my kind of starting ground for how, do, how I'm making my injects. The other thing that I would do is this is an example of a, a drawing for an insider threat attack. Um, so it's either vendor-based or employee-based or supplier-based, but Generally, you have some actual person who's wanting to do bad things or recruited people to do bad things, or they just didn't know that they were asked to do bad things and did bad things anyway. So as I'm laying out this attack map, <clears throat> I'm laying out all of my events um, that will be the injects. So the little explosion things is where things start. And then you see who all is involved um, with that response. Um, at the bottom, you have 
whatever insider threat response uh, team or method you have about going about it. But generally, these are the areas that are, it's composed of and the data and what they're bringing to the table to help respond to that. Maybe you just turn over any sort of investigation like that to local law enforcement. Cool. But what information do you have to give local law enforcement so that they can go and investigate and prosecute or potentially prosecute those individuals performing these functions? Just good discussion to have. But what your players are going to be responding to are all of those events. So as part of developing all of those events that I've laid out in that attack map, <clears throat> I need to build in the breadcrumbs that point them to what I'm the learning goal that I'm after. And I want them to go and exercise the insider threat response process. Um, that's the main goal. We can have a lot of other things that are attached or associated with the exercise, but at the end of the day, that's what I'm after on them testing. So in each one of those events, we would build in breadcrumbs that pointed back to a person or a time or some little nugget of information that would say, hey, this wasn't just a random event. This was caused by this or caused during this time. Okay, well, how do we know that was or what happened or who did something then? Well, let me see what other data I have. Maybe the physical security team has some badge records. Maybe we got some camera logs. Maybe we got some system data. Maybe we got, you know, a check-in sheet or whatever, a visitor sign-in sheet um, there or a process to check people in. Or maybe we have a time card, you know, of who was on shift at that time. That's where you start, you know, building your game. And you give the players more than just, here's a bad thing that happened, go fix it. It's, let's see, let's choose my own adventure and see which page they turn to next and figure out how to make, how to make that a little bit more exciting. The other thing that I'm looking at is how do we put points to this? So people like winning things. Um, they like knowing that they did good. Um, taking it out of the, you know, correction, needs improvement, whatever. Let me give you some points for it. Um, let me give you some gold stars or some sort of scoring mechanism that makes you feel like you did good. Because um, our players and players generally in every exercise that I've seen will do some pretty awesome stuff you know, just kind of out of the box, like crazy activities that you never would expect them to do, but they did. Let's give them a chance to win and uh, let's make their actions meaningful because a lot of times what you'll see is exercises have been, been designed around nothing but badness and the, the planners have spent a lot of time developing badness, but when a player comes in and does something good, they don't want to change the badness because they might have another learning objective or they might have something tied to it or maybe they just want to throw more badness at them if a player wins or you know puts in a defense there that should prevent that function you have to be able to quickly change that exercise direction otherwise your players are going to say well i just shut down all the firewalls and you know it doesn't matter we we would never be attacked now but oh we, we got the super malware Lots of things I've run into over doing this for 10 years. Um, so anyway, so you have the main quest. This is just like your tabletop games. Um, the events that will lead and drive that part of the scenario um, through. And then all of the side quests um, that your players can go and do additional skills and get additional information or do a, something interesting, um, like your leadership communications. If you're doing that mock interview, if you're doing, if you're wanting to see what information, you know, if your company has been attacked, what information is being collected and disseminated to your uh, employees, the public, government, um, local law enforcement, federal law enforcement, whatever the case may be. What, is, what are we doing out of that side quest? What are the specific points that we want them to focus on or learn from? And then how are we going to evaluate that? So what's our point structure? Doesn't really matter which method you use as far as scoring them, as long as it's consistent game to game or exercise to exercise, they understand and you have to let them know what's good and what's not so good. So building your planning team. Uh, a very core element of any exercise I've ever run is I can't do this alone. 
Um, I have learned more planning exercises about my company's operations than anything else I've ever done in my career. Um, you learn where all the holes are, you learn how everything's gonna work when bad things happen, but you generally have a lot of experts across your organization that have a lot of skills and experience with and thought through a lot of these things already on their own um, that are good to go and bring and get them together for a couple months uh, ahead of time because exercises take a lot of planning time. Um, the rule of thumb that I had was for every 10 injects is a month. Um, if you were uh, going every five or five or more business units, you need three to four months. Um, the larger the exercise gets, the more people that are playing, the more events that you're trying to run, the more planning time that you're going to need to put it all together and find that thread that will weave the story. Um, so these are a lot of the groups um, that I'll generally reach out to. Um, HR and finance, um, not always everybody's first thought, but they have a lot of information and engagement when bad things happen. Um, if people, unfortunately, were, would ever be um, killed or injured at your um, company, HR is very much involved with that. Um, so they get to make a lot of uh, notification process, um, death notifications, that's their area. Um, when employees get mad that they're not gonna get paid, that's HR and finance, but really HR. Um, so they're very involved with COVID. COVID, I'm sure your HR group was heavily involved with communicating and trying to uncluster that. Um, but anyway, look around your company, figure out which groups are there. Um, try and get them all tested because bad days happen in some way, shape, or form. If the group is going to be involved in that response, they should plan an exercise. Um, another thing that I have is the patient zero method. So a lot of exercises will start with everybody sitting in a conference room, like I said. That's really boring and you feel the urge to rush through um, throwing a sink at them or punching them you know, giving them that hellmaker, haymaker up, uppercut um, to get all of the bad things going. And that's generally not how events day to day would go. So my go, my go to is let me start with that one call to the help desk. Let me start with that one call to the physical security response line. Let me start with one player and say, this is the bad thing that happened. Here's the information that you have you need to go and activate your response plan or you or don't even tell them but just here's the bad thing that's happened go and then they have to go through their activation communication notification process to get all the other players engaged and it's really interesting when you get to lunch and you look around the table who's not there and they were never called they were never told it wasn't because they probably weren't written into the procedure, it's because it generally probably gets overlooked or they didn't go line by line through a checklist or procedure or have some sort of automated notification process. Lots of things, but it's happened a lot in the exercises where I've run this method. Somebody's not there and then they're really mad that they're not there, but you pull them in after lunch and you're saying, hey, you know, we never called cybersecurity about this thing. Why? In that, in that, exercise pause hot wash where you're just talking with the players about what's happened. Always a good uh, lesson learned opportunity there. Um, the other area that I've run into is how do you know what your players are good at? So we can get a lot of people into a room, but I don't know what they do. I don't know what their day-to-day -day, day -day job is. I don't know what their skills, abilities, um, and resources are. Um, so what I'm working on um, to try and cover that is character sheet. So in tabletop land, all of your characters who are participating in your party come into it with a sheet telling you what they what their job is, what their class is, what their background is, what their alignment is, which is always some interesting ones. I plan to keep the alignment one on the uh, individual person uh, character sheet, but I'm gonna model that after what D&D uses. And what I'm gonna look at is having the discussion um, with management and the people that they're supervising. What is their college background? What courses did they actually take? 
what training certifications have they done what you know for the people that haven't gone to college what has your 10 years of experience been what has been your experience outside of it so you might be super awesome at writing reports and communicating and looking at things from a non-technical ones and zeros perspective all the time but you pick that up along the way because you're just awesome i'm not really good at adapting all that that's why i went straight ones and zeros but you have skills and feats and features that makes you a unique snowflake to that response team otherwise you wouldn't be there how do we capture that and communicate that so when you come into the incident response exercise here's what i'm good at i'm really good at forensics i'm really good at incident response i'm really good at investigating you know packets but hey i'm also really good at incident management i can go run an emergency operations center because i've completed all of these courses how do we break that out and understand what our abilities and skills really are so that's um everything in a nutshell um i can talk about this stuff for days exercise planning and running exercises is one of my favorite things to do um i've learned a lot i hope you learn a lot and take the opportunity to step up and say hey yeah i'll, I'll build out the next exercise or i'll run the next exercise for the um, group or company or whatever you will learn so much from conducting an exercise and getting that internal network of people who know how bad things really happen and what the response really will be if you've been fortunate enough to avoid that um, and the unfortunate thing is we look at exercises you know it is fun to play but it is a bad day um, if it's con actually happens um, whether on the physical side or the cyber side really bad things will happen it's never fun um, but we have to train like we fight we fight like we train and unfortunately until bad people want to stop doing bad things we have to be ready to do defend and respond to those um, so hopefully at some point we will be done fighting cyber wars and we will not we will choose not to play but that's all i have thank you for your time and i will accept any questions I was making a joke about uh, the the haymaker comment. Uh, I said, I'm, I'm sure you're not advocating for throwing uh, literal haymakers at uh, coworkers, only metaphorical ones. Oh, yes. Yeah. So the, it's part of the joy of running exercises. It's a big stress reliever. So it's like, you know, oh, my company made me mad. How would I destroy it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I've, I've had those conversations like, man, imagine if... Mm. You know, I remember when we were pen testers, like you'd run into those companies that are, are just not going to take security seriously or fund it until they have a breach. So we used to joke about uh, breach as a service, you know, like mm -hmm. <laughs> how could we just hurry up and, and make the failure happen so they can just uh, get on with uh, taking this seriously. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's very eye opening when you can show them. Uh, you know, actual images or images of it happening in other places, give them relevant data and threat intelligence to say the likelihood of this event happening here is really high. If it did, here's what would happen. Here's what it would cost the company um, to not only respond, but to recover and as well as our loss of revenue and operations. And when they start seeing like, you know, multi-million dollar dollar signs, it generally catches some attention. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. So we we do have some questions coming in. I think I think the first thing that came in was was just more of a comment. Uh, you know, somebody uh, uh, liked your approach here. They said exercise and evaluation could absolutely be distilled into some kind of a high score that uh, players in the org can use as a visualization of how they perform. That's a great idea. And um, Let's see, as an MTG and D&D player, have you considered making the leap into the Warhammer universe? Why or why not? That's um, literally I'm, your first question. <laughs> I've <laughs> done all of the nerd things. I played Warhammer as well um, when I was in the army. Um, but pa painting an army and, uh, yeah, it, it was very time consuming. Um, and I already had my cardboard addiction. Okay, okay, so uh, uh, the, the level of effort painting figurines was a factor? 
Yeah, which I paint D&D mini, so it's weird. Yeah. All right. Um, any suggestions for designing exercises for SMBs? Smaller companies. Yeah, so really your scale. I mean, you can still do cool stuff. Um, you know, when you have fewer people available, you generally have them for less time. Um, so if you can scale it back and do probably more exercises versus one long exercise and just kind of carry the game along through multiple campaigns like you would in a tabletop uh, type of game. So you're not running through a full dungeon every time you sit down to play a D&D session. It's generally week to week or month to month or whatever you can get in. Hey, let, let me get an hour and let's talk about this next phase. Um, or I would like to get some time and talk about this one event and then get build the complexity over time or run more smaller exercises. And then you can, if you can get the time, run the one big one with all of the pieces put together and all of your lesson learned already kind of figured out from the smaller ones. Um, that's how I would try and do it. All right. And so how do you... there, sorry, there's lots of companies out there that will uh, come in and help and build you an exercise based on whatever you want to do. Um, lots of good security companies. Um, I won't nominate them, but um, if you if you talk to any of your security providers, they generally have this. Also, if you have an incident response retainer, um, a lot of times they'll use uh, that retainer if you didn't have an actual incident to come in and do an exercise for you. Nice. Yeah, definitely. Back back when I used to uh, train folks, and when I talk about this. You know, I, I liken it to a sport. You know, you're only going to be good, you know, uh -huh. as good as your practice, you know. And if you practice once a year, well, imagine it's a sport and you practice once a year. Uh, uh -huh. What are you really expecting to happen? <laughs> yeah. When you when you practice that infrequently. Um, yeah. Right. Let's see. How do you really get buy-in from all parties involved? It takes a lot of time. Um, generally, you want to look and start from the top. You want to go get you that senior leader sponsor, um, whether it's the director or leader of your physical security team or your CISO or your chief operating officer. Um, you want to go get you an executive that's going to support um, your efforts to go and recruit others. Um, so getting their letterhead, um, or a message from them communicating out to their directs or whatever, and trickling that down is a great way. Um, and then just building up exercise participation over time. So the first exercise I ran, I think I had 30 people. Um, it was two business units. Uh, it lasted about six hours, but it was done really well. And they, were then you know, very supportive and helped communicate that to other business units. Also bringing in those groups that aren't playing and letting them observe what the exercise was. Um, that's how um, a lot of your national level exercises um, have grown over time is they let you know, the smaller companies or the, the companies that were like, well, do we really wanna invest time to develop this? Well, come watch, or let's let's walk you through the lessons learned. Here's everything that resulted out of it, and they get excited about it, and then they want to come and play the next one. Um, so it's really just so, trying to. So what is that build. piece that gets them excited about it, though? Like, like, is it uh, how important is it for it to be fun and entertaining, versus just uh, I don't know, I guess uh, very tightly run and effective. Yeah, so I mean, if you go sit in a room for four hours and you're just having a dry conversation, I mean, it's not very exciting, right? Um, but if you're having to call you know, or getting calls from, you know, your CEO simulated. So I I do a lot of like character voices, um, a lot of different character attitudes, um, try and vary that up um, to give them a little bit of a different experience. But I put... So literally like a DM, like, like you're doing different yeah. voices and... <laughs> Yeah. That's great. Um, so, I mean, if you can make it exciting, then they're excited to talk about it. And then they're excited right. to talk about what they learned. Yeah. Um, it's just, 
well, we went in there, we went through the policy, everything on the policy stays the same. Uh, we're, we might not do the next one. I mean, they're not going to be excited. They're not going to want to learn anything and they're going to be disgruntled about, you know, the training program. So I think it's a little bit of both. Um, you really got to figure out those learning objectives, spend a lot of time focusing on how are we going to do things better? What do we want them to do? What, what do we think our risk are? I mean, if you're going, I mean, we've gone through every risk matrix assessment process under the sun, but I can go take all of that risk and build it into an exercise and show you what would actually happen if it happened today. Cool. There, there's a podcast I used to listen to. Uh, I think he quit doing it, but uh, Purple Squad Security used to do this mm -hmm. podcast where he'd invite, I don't know if you've heard of it, but he'd invite other podcast hosts onto his show. And whenever they came on his show, they would do a tabletop, uh -huh. um, you know, like, like a quick uh, 30, 40 minute tabletop. And they were, they were hysterically funny. Like, like, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, you're doing a good job when, when somebody can listen to a recording of it for purely for entertainment purposes. Yeah. I've listened to a couple of those and they are really funny just on the, the crazy responses in a lot of cases. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, we've got a few other comments. Um, I don't think we have any more questions though. So I think that, uh, and, and timing is perfect here. I think that about wraps it for us. Um, well, yeah, I appreciate the time and I'm glad everybody came and I'll be in the Discord for a little bit if anybody wants to chat. Yeah, definitely uh, check out some of the some of the discussion go that was going on there during your talk. Cool deal. Thank you.